It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of October 6, 1995. we got six movies to look at today, so let's get right on into it. And we'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend, and that is Sylvester Stallone and Antonio Banderas, starring in Richard Donner's action thriller, Assassin. You know, I admire Richard Donner for trying to do something a little bit different outside of what he made him so successful. But uh, I think even he admitted that this movie really did not end up playing out as well as they wanted it to. I mean, you got a good script here. By, you got a script by Brian Helgeland, who later went on to win an Oscar for writing L.A. Confidential. And the Wachowski brothers, of all people, wrote this movie before they eventually went on to make the Matrix films. And Stallone's doing the best job he could with the material given to him. I mean, this is a better Stallone film that came out this year than Judge Dredd. I mean, that... Is easier said than done. Antonio Banderas is coming off of Desperado. Another chance for him to shine. And he does a pretty good job in here as well. But other than that, though, the movie is pretty lifeless. And it's really, really slow paced. Like, there's... Slow pacing can work every one, if, if the writing is very good and the characters are well written. But not in this case. Like, it feels like this movie was just trying to be something that it really wasn't. I think they, I think because they spent so much money rewriting the script and hoping that Richard Donner could just make the material work with what, it, what they could do, and the fact that they made the central characters a little too sympathetic and maybe more too likable, maybe, but, I mean, it's hard to make assassins likable, but this movie tried way too hard, and I think it, they did a little bit too much, so. But, uh, yeah, I really don't remember a whole lot about this movie. This is one that was a hit actually was actually a hit but it didn't critically not fi not critically financially but critically it did not do so well and um you can kind of see why it's kind of a lifeless film the only if, if he, the only thing you could say that's positive about this movie is that this is the part this is where that meme of Antonio Banderas is looking up in the air this, that's where that movie that's where this that meme came from is this movie so that's the only thing you can really take from it that's really not a good sign whatsoever so so yeah, Assassins, not a very good way to start the week off, but um, let's see if the Hughes Brothers could follow up Menace to Society on a better note, and uh, that film is, of course, Dead Presidents. So this basically tells the life of Anthony Curtis, played by Lawrence Tate, who, and focusing on his teenage years in high school, as a high school graduate and his experiences during the Vietnam War. This takes place in the 1960s. He returns to his hometown in the Bronx to find himself struggling to support his family and, his, and, and himself, and he turns to a life of crime. And um, it certainly is not as good as something like Menace to Society, but in terms of movies that come after somebody's breakout directorial efforts, this is not a bad movie. I just don't think it's... It's a very ambitious film. It has a lot of possibilities to it. It has a great cast. Keith David's also in here. Uh, Chris Tucker, Nabushi, Nabushi Wright from Blade, Bokeem Woodbine, Freddie Rodriguez. I mean, the pieces are definitely there, but you can definitely tell that there was a lot more ambition to this than what's actually shown on screen. I mean, the movie tries its best to try to get it get it all the way to the end on a good note, but um, it certainly pales in comparison to what these guys did with the with uh, Menace to Society. I think that movie was a much better film for them, and I don't think they really would ever come back to being on that same level again until later on down the line with it. I think the book of Eli is probably their second best film overall, at least in my opinion. Um, from hell, I'm not a big fan of American pimp. I've hardly, I've never even heard of that f film broken city, which is done by Alan Hughes is one largely forgettable. So is alpha. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's really all I have to say about this one. Dead presidents. It's a decent film. Not as, not on the same levels as menace to society though. So, Anyway, with that said, on to the next movie, and that is How to Make an American Quilt. One of those movies that was coming out during that time period of coming-to-age films, they were kind of the norm. You got stuff like My Girl, The Prince of Tides, Now and Then, Gold Diggers, The Secret of Bear Mountain, and this is definitely another one of those movies. And this is one of those movies that's another one of those mixed bags. I mean, it's Heart and Soul is definitely in the right place. A lot of really good, solid performances. Winona Ryder and Bancroft. Ellen Burstyn, Kate Nelligan, Alfie Woodard. There are solid performances all around here, but there's too much sappiness in some of the more dramatic moments that by the end of it, you come out feeling like you got something from this while also not feeling like you didn't get much enough. It's kind of like an Oscar Bages type of film. I mean, the performances are what keep the movie afloat. They're very good, but there's nothing else about this that really stands out, honestly. It's a coming-of-age story. It's about as predictable as you can get. 
I'd say watch it solely for the performances, but other than that, you have no real reason to rush out to see this movie. It's a largely forgettable film, and um, I thought I had more, but no, I don't. So that's um, How to Make an American Quilt. Now let's move on to the next movie, and that is Christopher Walken starring in The Addiction. I honestly never even knew that Abel Ferrer was involved with this movie. I never even heard of it because, I mean, I, when you think of Abel Ferrer, you think of stuff like King of New York, Bad Lieutenant, Body Snatchers, Dangerous Game, uh, notable films like that. But this is one of those movies that I've never even heard of, but it's got some good reviews for it. And it sounds like a very intriguing film. Uh, you follow a philosophy graduate student who is turned into a vampire after being bitten by a woman during a chance encounter. And after the attack, she begins to develop an addiction for human blood. And the film has been seen as sort of an allegory about drug addiction and an allegory of the, theatrical, the theological concept of sin. And um, it looks pretty intriguing. Like, it looks very unique just from that one little teaser trailer alone. I mean, you got Lily Taylor, Christopher Walken, Annabella Sciorra, Edie Falco, uh, Catherine Irby, uh, Michael Imperioli. Some notable names in here. I don't know. This could be something pretty interesting. I... Kind of curious to check it out one day. So that's really all I got for you because I haven't seen it, so I can't really say too much more about it. Let's move on to the next movie, and that is Strange Days. No joke, this movie almost killed the career of Catherine Bigelow, which is hard to believe because, I mean, 15 years later, she'd be accepting an Academy Award for Best Director. But um, yeah, this was a huge box office bomb when it came out. It nearly derailed her career. It only made about a sixth of its $42 million budget. The film was heavily polarized by critics, and nobody, nobody really wanted to see it at first. And then, slowly but surely, the critical standing on it improved over the years, and it did have a massive following over the years since then. It has gone on to have a cult following, and luckily, Catherine Bigelow's career didn't completely fall apart. But um, you could honestly make the argument that this is the first, this is a film that was maybe ahead of its time, and in a way, it is kind of. I mean. You have a movie here that's basically set in the last two days of 1999, following the story of this black marketer of recordings that allows a user to experience the recorder's memories and physical sensations as they attempt to uncover the truth behind the murder of a prostitute. And you have people like uh, Ray Fiennes, Angela Bassett, Juliette Lewis, Tom Sizemore in here. And there's also themes of, it's a mix of sci-fi with film noir conventions, as well as exploring themes of racism, abuse of power, rape, and voyeurism. Uh, the story by James Cameron was actually convinced around the time he made Aliens in '86, and uh, I think I think there was still I think him and Catherine Bigelow were still together. No, they weren't still together at the time. Linda ha he was married to Linda Hamilton at that point, but um, he found inspiration. They found inspiration for this by looking at the Lorena Bobbitt trial, the '92 riots, the Rodney King verdict, and it's a really intriguing film. Most of the film. It's shot with this POV shot that's very unique and very impressive for films at that time. It's like a very unique style of filmmaking here. Like I said before, I think this was just a movie that was way too ahead of its time because I think a lot of inspiration would later come from other films like this film. And I think they took inspiration from this film alone. because It's a very intriguing film. It's one that's very unique, very stylized. And like I said, I think it was just ahead of its time for to really... Is for people to really understand it back then, but it's since gone on to have a massive following, and I can definitely see why. I think this is one of her stronger films as a filmmaker, Catherine Bigelow's, and um, it's a very unique film. I highly recommend checking it out if you if you can find it. Uh, Strange Days. Uh, anyway, let's move on to the last movie that we have here, and that is Kicking and Screaming, not the Will Ferrell comedy. Yeah, definitely not the Will Ferrell comedy that centers around soccer. Uh, this is a much different kicking and screaming. Uh, this is actually the feature debut for Noah Baumbach, and if that's a name that you're not too familiar with, you probably have seen his work before. He wrote Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. He wrote Fantastic Mr. Fox. He wrote Madagascar 3. He's about to write Barbie. Uh, he did The Squid and the Whale, Margot at the Wedding, Greenberg, Marriage Story, Francis Ha. He has made some movies that you are very familiar with, and this is the first one he ever did, and... Uh, for a first-time director, it's a pretty damn good movie. It's a very solid film, good writing all around, great performances all around. You have Josh Hamilton, uh, Olivia Dabo, Parker Posey, uh, Eric Stoltz, Elliot Gould, Marissa Ribisi, uh, Bombach himself is in here, Jessica Heck, Perry Reeves. 
Some names that you might not be too familiar with, but when you see their faces, you will definitely know that you've seen them before. And, um, interesting, Jason Blum actually w produced this film, and this is one of his first movies he ever produced. He obtained financing after receiving a letter from Steve Martin, who was a family acquaintance of them, endorsing the script, and he basically sent attached a letter to copies of the script that he sent to Hollywood, and lo and behold, look at what Jason Blum has done now in the, tw in the almost th almost 30 years since, that, since this movie's come out, so... But uh, yeah, highly recommend Kicking and Screaming if you haven't seen it already. It's a very good film. And so on that note, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. Next time we meet, we'll take a look at Friday the 13th of October 1995. Probably should have been the weekend they put up, would have put out Halloween because that probably would have made a lot of money. But we have some notable films, and we have the two biggest releases being some of the most controversial films of the time, and not for the best reasons. We have the infamous Jade. We also have the infamous The Scarlet Letter with Demi Moore and Gary Oldman. We have Blue in the Face, the film that was actually filmed while they were making the movie Smoke. Uh, we have Feast of July and Delta of Venus. So we'll look at those five movies on the next episode. Uh, but until then, thank you very much for watching. And if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the plays on the next page. Check out the previous episode. And I will see you guys tomorrow for another episode. So thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. And until then, as always... Take care.